So welcome everyone to the last module of the core uh, modules, uh, the module on mutable content. So this module will be focused on the tail end, uh, basically how to uh, ensure that we have mechanisms to achieve mutability, mutable data uh, on a distributed application. Um, and the, the the structure of this module, I'll, I'll start by uh, just like unpacking and like motivating why mutable data uh, is important for distributed applications, um, and then I'll build up the stack from bottom up um, that enables that, starting from the messaging layer and explaining uh, our peer to peer uh, pub sub protocols that enable that to come to reality. Then going into how to actually achieve uh, mutable pointers and how to make sure that they are secure and authentic. Then I'll take a tangent and I'll talk a little bit about like data structures uh, that are available to us today that make uh, mutable data uh, a simpler construction for distributed applications, but also a more powerful one than the ones that we are used on centralized applications. Then I will also touch on um, access controls. So. Um, access controls powered by capability systems so that we don't need um, a central point of authority to coordinate this. And then I'll end the, the module by just like highlighting some uh, of the other uh, toolkits that are out there that enable you to build these kinds of apps so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel once again. So starting with motivation. So one thing that is very important for us as we build a decentralized web, a distributed web, is that we we don't want to lose the rich experiences that the web 2.0 got us used to. So we want to be able to collaborate, um, to do our work, to talk with our loved ones, to have chats with friends, to share photos and so on. Like that is now part of, our, of the regular user expectation when they use the web platform. However, on the web three, we want to do all of this without mandating a centralized infrastructure. We see centralized infrastructure or just um, infrastructure as a way to augment the quality of the service, not something that should be mandated, that need, needs to be in place for the service to work. And so, uh, but like to, to, in order to meet this demand, to meet this requirement, like it's important for us to understand like what, what is mutable content about, right? And so we now are already very familiar with IPFS and now it gives us immutable identifiers, CIDs, um, to link to immutable content and to verify its integrity. However, rich web apps um, do need dynamic data, like content is always changing. We need to enable users, um, application builders, the, to allow for creation of new data, for edits, for updating existing edit, uh, data from text, images, and so on. And as as users do this, like they need to be able to notify the other users of the, the platform that these changes are happening. And it is also important uh, because this is just like the normal interaction pattern that as um, these documents, these shared documents evolve, like we need to be able to give uh, read and write access, but also able to rev uh, revoke them. Um, and, and like we know that there's like multiple interaction patterns that are very common nowadays from like the one to many, like blogs to for many to many social networks, or even many to one where like it just um, like multiple publishers publishing content that then a few subscribers subscribe to. Um, and we already are seeing the, the boom happening. So like the IPFS ecosystem is very rich on dynamic apps. Um, so there, there needs to be a way for these apps to work in a decentralized way. And so to help us throughout this presentation, I'll actually uh, use the OSI layer system to, to just like guide us, like to give us a map of like what are the multiple pieces that are available. And now they like map into this, uh, to this layer system uh, so that we know which Piece serves what purpose? Um, starting with lip peer to peer. So, this is one that we are going to be taking for granted during this presentation. And so, lip peer to peer is a network inside of IPFS, now of Ethereum 2 as well, of Filecoin, and many, many other projects. And what it gives us is the property of process addressing. We can dial to any other process in the network using a, a, pi a public private key pair. And with this, we get end to end connections fully encrypted and that are reliable, they, and they can use any kinds of transport. So assuming that we have we peer to peer as our baseline transport layer, network, data link, and physical, um, what is there else that needs to happen that needs to be in place in order to enable the mutable data applications? So let's start off with messaging layer. So a messaging layer um, uh, 
that we have built um, is uh, supported by peer-to-peer PubSub. And the reason why we picked uh, peer-to-peer PubSub is because PubSub in its core, uh, the public subscribe, um, it, it enables uh, a whole set of interaction patterns uh, because th- there is an ability to, to to separate the concerns. So what do I mean by that? Like uh, when we uh, when we use something like PubSub, we have message oriented communication, and so with this message oriented communication, um, it gets easier to separate the concerns because now every process, every service, every agent can message other agents in the same application, in the same network, and um, they, they can interface uh, using that, that message layer. Uh, however, this doesn't come uh, just with all of the benefits. It also has some challenges that are unique for a peer-to-peer a distributed environment. Because like most of these networks are permissionless, um, we can, cannot really control like who joins or leaves. And in addition, because again, like people can join and leave at any time, the network topology is not top down. Like it's not based on brokers as we see in many other message queue uh, services. It's actually bottom up, right? Like the, the nodes come together and they define their routing tables as they learn information about the network. And this added we churn where nodes are rather ephemeral and will just be online for the time uh, that they need to access the service. Um, it makes it very hard uh, to design algorithms that can do a good trade-off between latency, bandwidth, and deliver guarantees. And so typically there is no one size fits all solution. There is just like a bunch of recipes that we make available so that then the application can design what they are looking for. And so the way that we approach this to enable these multiple recipes is that uh, on IPFS, we peer to peer pub sub stack. Um, we decided to go with the topic based interface, which is the, the simplest. So subscribe to a topic, receive the messages on that topic. Same goes publish on a topic, everyone receives. And uh, our design goals was to ensure that like, it was very reliable, that was highly efficient and, and um, low latency. And that was very resilient, uh, not only to network churn, but also to a multitude of attacks that uh, malicious actors can try to pull in these like, permissionless uh, networks. Um, that could scale as the, the application scale up, right? So that like that it benefit from the fact that it is a peer-to-peer architecture to be able to deliver and to cope with the demands as the network uh, grows. Um, and ultimately that is parameterizable. As I said, like there is no one size fits all solution. So it's very important that we can pick uh, a few solutions or even adjust depending on the size of the network or the use case. And so right now, today, we have two main implementations, one known as FloodSub and the other known as GossipSub. And so FloodSub um, is the, the simplest possible design. Essentially, it uses like ambient peer discovery. What this means is it just like gets to connect to the peers that like just happen to connect naturally, either through the DHT that is available on the IPFS public network, multicast DNS, or some other system. And the routing of the messages is through flood. Uh, what this means is uh, basically every peer will transmit the message to every single other peer that is connected to. It is very robust when with regards to delivery guarantees because like if you pick all the paths to broadcast your messages, then you are certainly um, going to reach every single other node, other except for the case where there is an actual network split and there is no single path between both networks. Um, and this minimizes the, the latency of the delivery because if you pick every path, then you are sure to pick always the shortest path. Um, like th- th- that is a guarantee. Uh, however, it comes with a huge cost, right? And so we can see in this diagram here uh, at the bottom of the slide where we can see that like, nodes get the messages very, very quickly. But I, at this later stage, like nodes are actually now repeating the messages um, that other nodes already have sent. So it creates a huge bandwidth overhead because a ton of duplicate messages are received. Um, and, and there is no good way to control for that. Uh, just so that you can see how chatty uh, this protocol, this algorithm is, we have here a simulation uh, that shows like for 100 peers, five messages per second in a run of two seconds. And like we speeded up the visualization so that like you, everyone can see how chatty it is. Uh, but you can see that like, there's a lot of rev, that there's a lot of communication. Uh, and again, this is just like five messages per second, run for two seconds. So this is just 10 messages. And we can see the amount of duplicated work that, that happens on the network. 
what about um, Gossip Sub? So Gossip Sub is kind of like our bleeding edge peer-to-peer pub sub implementation that we released last year. And now it is used for the main IPFS network, for the Filecoin network, and also for the Ethereum 2 network and many other uh, applications and protocols are adopting it. And um, it is designed with a, a like a novel idea and a very key insight. Rather than having a single network um, that like is used to distribute the messages, uh, there, there, uh, there is actually a separation between the data plane and the control plane. And so the data plane is where the messages go to other peers, but the control plane is where the gossip, the metadata of the network, the stability, the messages that have been created, the messages that have been delivered, um, the, the latency between peers and so on. And so this, this gossip, this mesh network is used for peers to understand the state of the whole network and to then make uh, some some decisions about like which nodes to connect to, um, uh, which nodes to uh, that they should drop in case that there is like some malicious behavior that they are detecting, and so on. Um, and because the gossip. Um, gets transmitted uh, to every heartbeat, there is a, a way for peers to, to see if they, by getting gossip from others, if they are missing some messages and requesting uh, um, messages from, from the other peers. And so uh, what it, this makes it, and, and I'll speak more to this in a little bit, uh, it makes it like very resilient to churn and to all sorts of attacks from Siebel, Eclipse, and spam attacks. Um, in, and it's designed to minim uh, minimize the bandwidth usage. However, the, the, the caveat here is that like for small networks, it actually might not make sense to use such an advanced algorithm because um, for a very small network, uh, if you have to pay the cost uh, of the network maintenance in additional messages, uh, you might actually be better off with just flood sub, where like every peer sends messages to everyone else. And, and like the, the overhead from flood sub actually um, it, it's okay when you compare to the latency that you get there. Uh, however, um, when you compare both protocols side by side and you increase the number of nodes in a network, because l l bandwidth is ultimately a limited resource, um, floods of a no of like the protocol can uh, choke on itself by creating so much overhead. And so it, there are simulations where for, for many, many, many nodes where gossip sub actually achieves lower latency just because it uses the bandwidth available uh, um, in an efficient way. So just to compare, here's now uh, a visualization of how uh, gossip sub uh, gets to do the same do the same uh, delivery of the 100 peers, five messages per second, but like with way less chatter. You can see uh, the, the yellow messages are the gossip, the red ones are the delivery of the actual messages um, of the actual data. And you can see it's like way more maintainable. Um, we, we went ahead and went beyond just like doing these simulation comparisons. We actually did a whole evaluation in a network of 10,000 peers, which is roughly the size of the Ethereum network. Um, and like we demonstrated how Gossip Sub is resilient to a variety of attacks. And we both published the, the evaluation report, which is 60 pages long. It's a really great read. And also we published a paper uh, that summarizes the architecture and, and the results of this evaluation. Additionally, as, we, as I said, um, there, are, there is no one size fits all, and we are always looking for new solutions for this messaging layer. So we do have um, an open problem that documents all the work done so far and all of the other ideas that we have that you can consult on our open problems page. Uh, and we welcome everyone that has new ideas to, to tell us about them and, and to uh, seek for opportunities to work together. And so with uh, PubSub, we now know that we have a way to establish this transport and session layer where we can establish a session around a topic and peers can coordinate around that topic and send messages to each other. So what about mutable pointers? Um, mutable pointers are a requirement for a multitude of use cases to make um, decentralized applications. And, and the reason why we think this is so important is ultimately because, again, we don't want centralized infrastructure to have to, um, to be present in order to enable like mutability, to, to have to enable uh, this like decentralized coordination. We, we want centralized infrastructure just as a way to augment the service, but the protocols, the applications should always work independent of the network conditions. Um, and, and like the, the, the key ingredient for mutable pointers in a distributed system is the ability to certify that the pointer was the, the 
by the way, I'm going to use pointers and name updates interchangeably. Pointer updates, name updates, I, I really mean the same thing. And so the, 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 the key uh, ingredient is like enable um, these pointer or name updates to be certified so that like when the subscribers, when the receivers receive this, this update, they can verify it was issued by the, the right person. Um, and so the, the way we approach this is through IPNS, the Interplanetary Name System. Um, and this uses a, a technique, um, a old technique, which is called cert self certified naming, which basically just says that like any pointer that gets published gets signed with a private key and validated with a public key. So peers that have the public key can validate any um, uh, correct authorship from the author that originally created the pointer. Uh, we designed this to, to provide this like verifiability feature, uh, versatility, like we, we want these pointers to be able to uh, use a multitude of transports, not just a single one. Um, and the, we also want these pointers to be able to point to a value or to a graph or to a set. Like there should not be a reason why to constrain the pointer to point to a single value. Uh, today we have multiple implementations. Like the, the most common one is IPNS over the, the IPFS public DHT, uh, where um, peers publish their name updates to DHT and other peers use the DHT to find the, those name updates. Then uh, we also have IPNS over PubSub, which makes the distribution of these updates really fast. There's also IPNS over DNS, over eDomains, Namecoin, um, and potentially we could do it over any transport, QR codes, NFC, BLL, BLE, beacons. There is multiple uh, possibilities. And now this works is um, in, in the architecture, as I said, like there is a public private key pair that gets generated. And so every time that the record, uh, and so, just one more more term there. So like pointer, name, or record. Uh, the record is what contains the information about this pointer or name. So every time there is a, a new record that contains new information about where the pointer points to, um, we create the record and we sign it with a, the private key. Then we publish it using the public key. And, and like what this gives, gives us is that, um, what this gives us is an ability to maintain a single unique name, which is the, the, the CID of the public key that is shared with all the other peers. And we can continue publishing under that name um, while uh, changing the pointer by signing it, uh, by changing it and signing it with the same private key. Then as the, the clients request the, the records that are published on that uh, public key, they receive it and they can validate it. And, and so the cycle repeats here um, that like every time there's a change, there just needs to be a, a publication uh, using the transport that was decided. Um, for example, uh, one way that this is being used today uh, and in order to achieve um, what we call human readable naming is that users, builders can use DNS to have some domain point to some text records that is an actual IPNS pointer. Um, and then when the user, when a PFS node resolves that, it will fetch the, IP, the DNS text record, understand it's an IPNS uh, pointer, resolve that IPNS um, uh, name, fetch the, the, the value that it points to, and then resolve the, um, the, the content of that value and serve that content to the user. And so like most of our websites, ipfs.io, www.io are actually served in this way. Uh, of course, um, we are always looking for new ways to, to achieve this. And so we also have open problems documenting the challenges of mutable data and human readable naming. So if you are interested in these problems, uh, please do read these open problems and, and tell us uh, what you think. So, so now we are getting um, we are getting our, our picture, uh, our puzzle completed. We now know how to um, distribute updates using PubSub, and now we know how to certify them using IPNS. However, mutable pointers are not enough for distributed applications. Um, in as Leslie Lampard put it, like the a distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't know. Uh, existed can render your own computer 
and usable. And, and why is this? Is because when you have multiple agents, multiple users like mutating the same data, uh, synchronization errors can happen. Like uh, when you have multiple people writing at the same time, um, that like creates conflicts, or just like by the sheer fact that like there is delay between um, the reception of these events in the network. Um, and so there achieving consensus about like what is the final state like what is actually the 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 ultimate true value is not a true a trivial problem and um and, and like there needs to be a better way to make sure that we can have coordination again without going back to the centralized uh point of authority route uh, that we can achieve coordination in a centralized way so this is where we go, go into type systems for distributed applications um and so what we want with these is to reach some convergent state or to achieve consensus over what is a distributed data, uh, what is a distributed state. Again, we don't want a central point of coordinator. This is a big theme of <laughs> this whole module. Um, and we want to support all types of collaboration. And um, ideally, of course, there's like multiple constructions today, but like we would prefer to avoid like resource intensive and, and slow constructions like PBFT, Nakamoto consensus and so on. And like we, we want to support web scale. Like we want to support the level, the, the speed of the interactions that users are used to in the web to And so this is where we get into conflict-free replicated data types. So this is like a fairly new and like large field of distributed systems research uh, that has seen a lot of development in the last decade. And uh, like the, the, the key insight here is that rather than having um, a central point of coordination, you just define what is the merge function, like you define the contract of how to do merges. And so once you define this contract, independent of the order of the events that you receive, you, like you know that every single participant will merge all the events in the same way. So they will all converge to the same state as they receive the events independent of the order. Um, so, so this is very important because it means like it doesn't require any interactivity at all. I can make a bunch of changes to some, some data and leave my notes um, somewhere that anyone can like, go and check. And then they can apply their own changes to my own changes and converge into a, a new state. Um, the, 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 the CRTT space, uh, however, it's not like a one size fits all solution. It's not that we can just say, uh, apply CRTT to the problem and it's solved. Typically, um, a CRTT is a data type. And so it is designed for a specific set of use cases. And so the whole field is about researching new data types that can be applied to more use cases. Um, with the, with the CRDTs, now we get like this presentation layer where we can actually create data structures that enable the collaboration that ride on top of the, our mutable pointers and our messaging layer. However, there's like one last ingredient missing to really enable fully distributed apps, which is access controls. Uh, so for access controls, we want to grant uh, and remove access to data. No need for central coordinator and to support multiple types of collaboration. And, and again, um, we, we want to avoid uh, slow and, and, and hard constructions that would make it uh, unfeasible for um, the day-to-day the -day applications. And this is where we get into cryptographic ACLs or also known as capability systems. Similar to the naming, like this also starts with uh, creating a public uh, and private key pair. Uh, and this public-private key pair is used to um, communicate the authorship. Then in addition, we also create a symmetric key uh, that is used to, uh, uh, to grant access to read. So in, in this example here, uh, we have the owner, the creator of the file, and then we have two participants, one that has read plus write access and the other that only has read. For the one that we want to give read plus write access, we share the write plus the read key. For the one that we only have access to read, we only give the read key. So once we do this, then we can share and send updates to the documents uh, to both participants, but only participant one will may be able to make edits because he will um, the, the, the participant one will be the um, uh, capable of signing any changes that it does with this private key that we shared before, while participant two won't. Like the, the, the changes that, the, uh, that, uh, that the, the participant two decides to make will not be acceptable, accepted because they, they are not signed by the private key. Um, 
Uh, so this gives us like a very fine grained control on read and write access and like authorship is indeed verifiable. Uh, however, uh, the, 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 the challenge here is like if, if the data is very sensitive and like you want to fast revocate access to some data set, you might need to have some kind uh, of external system, um, external consensus system to ensure that everyone follows the, the latest ACL rather than the one that was uh, distributed over the, the network itself. And so with this, uh, we get all the pieces and now we can build an application. So uh, for exemplifying, I'm going to use PeerPen. And PeerPen is a collaborative text editor that we built as a demo app. It uses IPNS to get, a, get the latest release of the app. Uh, IPFS to load the contents of the application. Uh, a public uh, and private key pair and a symmetric key um, gets distributed over the URL to grant the permissions. And so here we see that we have two links, the read-only link and the writable link. Um, and the trick we use here is like we put all these keys be beyond the, the hash sign, the pound sign, because those um, the data there on the URL bar never gets sent to any server. So we can share this URL through another side channel with a friend. Um, and we are sure of like that any information that is beyond the pound sign actually doesn't get sent anywhere. So it remains private. It, it's, a, it's a very clever trick to, to distribute access uh, to documents. Um, and then underneath, like we use a CRDT to, to share the state of the documents um, and pops up to distribute the messages. And so this document uh, this collaborative doc editor features like real-time collaboration and it's conflict-free. Multiple peers can be editing the document at the same time and they will see the changes that they are doing to the document converge over time. And so uh, just to, to, to wrap it up and to finish, uh, all of these pieces are available to you. You don't have to create your own libraries. Uh, you can just reuse the code. Uh, even PeerPad itself, it's uh, completely open source. Uh, and we have the, the security model and the architecture fully documented so that you can just like get inspiration. Um, and uh, there's a, a lot of other um, open source and uh, libraries and services that can provide you with these features and more from Ceramic, Textile, RBDB, DAPKit, and, and many more. So if you're curious about this or interested in discussing, or if you have ideas to even make these services better, let us know. Um, and with this, like you have concluded the, the whole set of core modules of the ResNet Lab on Tour program. Congratulations. Thank you so much for watching. And I look forward for your questions and comments.